Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the State of the Bay Symposium, although I think people have been here for a little bit. So thank you for coming. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to speak with some of the students and their posters. Um, and so, yeah, excited to have you here. Uh, for those who don't know, this is part of the Stony Brook Southampton SOMAS monthly seminar series. So we have one more that's going to be Wednesday, May 1st. Professor Tara Ryder will be giving a seminar on regional and local maritime history, and uh, she's very good. So I encourage you to attend that as well. And um, yeah, and then before I begin, I'd just to acknowledge, like to acknowledge a couple of or a few elected officials who are here. So uh, I know we've got uh, South Hampton Town Trustee President Scott Horowitz and Trustee Ed Warner here. So thank you for coming. We've got Tommy John Savoni here. Uh, we've got, where's Ann Welker, our Suffolk County legislator. There she is in the back. And um, I don't know if I'm missing anyone. I know we have Joyce, Joyce Novak from the Pecanic Estuary Program. Oh, and Matt Parsons, South Hampton Town Trustee, newly elected. And East Hampton Town Trustee, Celia. Josephson. So thank you for coming, uh, one and all. And um, yeah, and so yeah, I always have a tagline for my um, for these presentations, and uh, it wasn't on the advertiser because I wasn't sure what to use. So I just put up the you could see it in there is what what is the tipping point in science? Tipping point is a sometimes you can think of it as like a point of no return. So like when does an ecosystem change? It changes so much it's hard to get it back. Right. And, and I have it up there as a question, you know, because oftentimes in science, you don't know when you're at, you've reached or even past the tipping point until you're looking back in history. So, uh, you know, I don't have the answer, but it's always something to be to be wary of because these things do happen. And sometimes when they happen, things can change quite dramatically. OK, um, so I think we all know the scenario we're in here uh, on Long Island uh, with regards to it being a watershed uh, and that water falling to land being so important because it influences what goes into the ground. And that, of course, is doubly important, being both our drinking water supply uh, and also the water that if that's not extracted, discharging uh, into surface waters and potentially affecting uh, marine ecosystems there. Uh, and we know how much the groundwater beneath our feet has changed over time. Uh, you're looking there at the Suffolk County uh, Department of Health Services data with regards to nitrate in groundwater. And uh, that's a 60% rise since about 1980. So that's fairly significant. Uh, and, you know, it's not necessarily unique, but it's different. Um, I pointed this out before, but this is, if you look at the y-axis of this graph, uh, it peaks at 200 million people. Uh, so essentially, and that's these are people in the U.S., so about two-thirds of the country has nitrate with lower levels, excuse me, groundwater or drinking water with lower levels of nitrate than what we're seeing in Suffolk County. We're sort of in the tail end of things here or being at the higher end. Uh, and if you look at a map, you can see it's not all red, but there are areas that are hot spots uh, with high levels of nitrate. Now, as you all know, I'm a marine scientist, and I'm going to talk mostly about marine science today. Uh, but Stony Brook is an excellent university with an excellent medical school, an epidemiologist who uh, I get to talk to. Uh, and, you know, they think about nitrate in drinking water uh, beyond the way that it's been thought about to date. Um, so right now, the EPA is a standard of 10 milligrams per liter for drinking water, uh, and that's to prevent something called blue baby syndrome. Um, but, you know, nitrate can be dangerous for other reasons. And so I just want to uh, just make a quick point about that uh, and specifically talk about nitrosamines, which are carcinogenic compounds. Uh, they're found in tobacco smoke, uh, but they also can be formed in our stomachs under acidic environments. Um, and so that's something to be concerned about. And that's why actually the International Agency for Research on Cancer actually classifies nitrate and nitrites as um, probably carcinogenic. And looking at uh, these, this graph here shows over since 1978, the number of peer reviewed scientific publications looking at nitrate in drinking water and cancer. And essentially what this shows is that this is a hot research topic. Um, and so just to you know, highlight just two of the things that these papers are finding, 
Uh, firstly, that there are cancer risks associated with high nitrate. These are epidemiological studies, um, but at levels lower than 10 milligrams per liter. And if you look at the dates of these studies, let's see if this actually works. No, looks like I'm not going to get it to work. Um, but if you look at the dates of these citations, a lot of these are very recent studies. Uh, you can see just in the last, uh, this decade, um, most of the studies have been occurred. <clears throat> There's also recent, even more recent science looking at the effects of high nitrate on uh, babies when they're being, um, during gestation and negative health outcomes for those babies. And you can see these are even more recent studies. Now I've talked about this before. Uh, so if you've come to see the state of the bays, I've talked about this for several years. Um, and people would say, well, is anybody going to do anything about this? What about this? And so what's of interest, actually, is that just last November, the EPA took up nitrate as a compound in something they call their IRIS studies. So that's Integrated Risk Information System. And so that means they're starting the process of looking again at nitrate and it's essentially its effects on human health. Right. And so, you know, knowing all of this, what I've just showed you, I think it's what I would say is that we want nitrogen and nitrate in our drinking water as low as possible, right? Uh, and for many reasons, health reasons, but also with regards to surface waters and water quality and marine and aquatic habitats. So this is a map that we put together last fall. It represents what we call water quality impairments that were observed in 2023 between April and September. Uh, and so what you're looking at there are more than two dozen locations where oxygen standards didn't meet the minimum standard of EPA, I'll talk about that later, uh, or that we're experiencing different types of harmful algal blooms. Uh, and I'm gonna start with there, and uh, I think we, uh, many of you probably know, when it comes to harmful algal blooms, we have those that can make biotoxins, but also those that can be harmful to ecosystems, we can call ecosystem disruptive. Um, and there's been a lot of research over the years showing that more nitrogen can make these events either more intense or more toxic. Uh, I'll talk about the latter momentarily. And if we start in freshwater, we're here looking at Lake Agawam, which is in the village of Southampton, uh, right next to the Atlantic Ocean there. So the, the coloration of that lake really stands out. Um, and so we worry about these blue-green algal blooms or cyanobacterial blooms uh, because these are the type that can make a biotoxin. So specifically, uh, the most common type of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria is microcystis, and it makes microcystin. You can see the compound there. Uh, this is a gastrointestinal toxin. When it was first discovered, it was named fast death factor by scientists uh, in the 20th century. Um, and it's, it can be a powerful, these toxins can be powerful. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, these papers here, uh, they've been linked to the death of large mammals. Uh, and small mammals. So, um, for example, the study by the CDC showed hundreds of cases of, for example, dog poisoning associated with um, cyanobacterial toxins. And we've had certainly events um, on Long Island, in Suffolk County, uh, and on the South Fork. Uh, and for that and other reasons, the DEC does track these events carefully uh, and have found more and more places with these blooms through the years. Um, you know, part of the state of the bays is reviewing last year and what 2023 looked like. So these are the different counties across New York State that had blue-green algae blooms in 2023. Uh, and I note that this is 48 of 62 total counties, which essentially means it's a pretty comprehensive look. Um, and but what stands out is that Suffolk County had more of these events than any other county in New York State. And I have kind of two bars there. The, the smallest bar is what I got from the DEC data, and then the, the TAC honor areas that we certainly documented uh, across uh, Long Island that weren't on the DEC um, website. And if you look here on the South Fork, you'll, you'll note between essentially where we're standing here uh, and around Napeague, there's about a dozen sites that have come up uh, just last year all at once. Uh, and then further east from there was um, an event that you know, we don't want to be looking at and or we don't want our coastal waters looking like that. And this is in Montauk, just downtown Montauk, just two days after Labor Day. This is a very, very intense, I think this is the most intense blue-green algae bloom uh, of the season. Uh, it didn't persist super long, but you know, these are the sorts of events when they get that, that intense that can be a threat to um, 
you know, to public health or animal health. And so, and just on the drivers of these, you know, these events can be driven by nutrients, they can be driven by warm temperatures. Traditionally, they've been thought of as being driven largely by phosphorus, but it's now known that nitrogen plays a very important role. And the title there is the dual role, because in addition to promoting the events, many of the toxins that these um, harmful algal blooms make, including microcystin, are nitrogen-rich compounds. So when the organism has more nitrogen, it has the ability to make and actually even store more of this toxin, and it works in reverse. With less nitrogen, it makes less of the toxin. So moving to uh, marine events uh, of the harmful algal blooms, the most, what I'd say, dangerous of them all is uh, events by alexandrium because it makes saxitoxin. Saxitoxin is a neurotoxin. Um, it's a thousand times more potent than cyanide. Um, and in areas where they can't monitor the entire coastline, it can be very dangerous. And we know that this organism is endemic to the waters across Long Island. Uh, it's usually just a spring phenomenon. Uh, but you can see here, there are many places that have a red dot. Those are areas that have been experiencing intense blooms. And so uh, up until 2023, so 2006 through 2022, you can see there's seven locations that experience a shellfish bed closure due to these events. Um, and I'll note this is a complete record. So there were no events prior to 2006. Everything's been since that time. Um, and I'll also say that 2023 had more of these events than any year prior. So in April of 2023, there were three different systems that had shellfish bed closures in the Peconic Estuary, uh, including uh, the Jockey Creek, Town Creek area. It's the first time that it happened. Uh, and that's the first time that Flanders Bay, that all of Flanders Bay had been closed. At least, excuse me, that's the um, western half had been closed to shellfishing. And then on the South Shore um, in April and then in May, Shinnecock Bay and Riches Bay had areas that were closed uh, due to shell um, to shell fishing due to uh, saxitoxin. And this is just to show that again, nitrogen is a strong driver here. This is an experiment. Uh, Lucas Chen, I think, and Jen Galeski who are here did this experiment with water from Sag Harbor, where by adding nitrogen they could. Uh, in, in just a short period of time, more than double the amount of cells that were in the water, uh, which wasn't a surprise. We've published on this in the past. Uh, in fact, we've even done work where we've used uh, nitrogen isotopes to trace the type of nitrogen that the cells are using, uh, and you can differentiate fertilizer from wastewater, and we got a very strong wastewater signal, nearly 100% match for wastewater in the cells during these blooms, suggesting that they're using wastewater-derived nitrogen. The sister species to Alexandrium is uh, dinophysis, and this uh, is another dinoflagellate, makes a different toxin. This is a gastrointestinal toxin, okadaic acid. The species is also widespread across Long Island, uh, and we had a very unusual event in 2023 uh, in a very unusual place. Um, I sometimes joke to people that I feel like I've been to, when I was in graduate school, my graduate advisor said, oh, you've been to every 7-Eleven on Long Island. <laughs> Uh, that complements what I was about to say, which is, I feel like I've sampled every little river, cove, and estuary across Long Island, but this is one that I had never seen before. And uh, one of my former students, Luke Orman, who works for Town of Brookhaven, texted me suddenly one day and said, you should look at Little Sea Tuck Cove. It looks really, really red. Um, and so, sure enough, we went out there, and again, I think Lucas and other people were out getting water. Uh, and that's what the water looked like, but the, the amazing thing there was the, the density of this particular bloom at 100 million cells per liter. Before that, what we thought was the, you know, the all-time record was 2 million cells per liter. And I could go into the reasons that we have a good sense of the all-time records via colleagues across the globe and across the country, uh, but very, very dense bloom. Uh, and the unusual thing about this bloom, sometimes these blooms pop up and they go away. That event in Fort Pond just lasted about a week. This event lasted at more than a million cells per liter for more than a month. And so that is what's shown in the, in the graph there in the upper right. Um, we pulled hard clams from this particular uh, region, sent them to collaborators at Virginia School of uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, uh, which were able to find the toxins in the shellfish. Uh, it was more than uh, more than double at the, the national closure level. And you know, thankfully the DEC had taken the proactive measure of closing this area. I should just say, very importantly, with regard to all these toxins, 
the shellfish depurate. So as soon as the bloom ends, they begin to internally break down the toxins and the toxins are gone in very short order. Um, and I should also mention that DEC is very vigilant. So, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at, and the whole shellfish industry is incredibly well-regulated. Um, and so, you know, what happened here is exactly the way it should happen. DEC saw there was an event, the area was closed, no one got sick, any shellfish ever consumed on Long Island is properly tagged, bagged, uh, and everyone knows where it comes from. Uh, when it comes to these events, again, we've done the studies in the past and we're able to show that you know, nitrogen is a strong driver for dinophysis blooms as well. So since 2014, we've been, um, my lab with the lab here has been monitoring uh, all these different sites all across Long Island, North Shore, South Shore, East End, West, uh, and uh, on about a weekly basis during summer. And we get a lot of information from all that. Uh, and so we had an event last summer where uh, one of the students in my lab, Adrian Tracy, who's sitting uh, right here, who used to work for the, the uh, main department of natural resources, uh, and she worked with shellfish there, and so knew all about uh, different types of HABs and different things with shellfish, and she said, uh, you know, I, I'm seeing something weird in the samples, uh, specifically seeing Sudonychia, and so I said, Really? I've never seen it before. But of course, these cells are so, so tiny. So Adrian had an eye for it. Uh, but she picked it up and um, and we began seeing it at other locations as well. Um, and the thing is about Sudonychia, there are dozens and dozens of species globally distributed. So it doesn't necessarily mean anything just because we've seen uh, Sudonychia. Um, but it is an organism of concern. It does make something known as tomoic acid, um, which can lead to something called amnesic shellfish poisoning. Uh, and the way domeoic acid works, it looks a lot like glutamic acid. You have glutamic acid for all of your neurons. So this replaces those glutamic acid receptors for your neurons that can lead to lysis and death of neurons uh, because it doesn't function like glutamic acid. Um, I don't have time to go into the details. Have you ever seen the movie The Birds? It was inspired by uh, domeoic acid poisoning of birds on the West Coast. I can tell you the story at some other time, but it's, it takes too long. Um, and there were the first time this was actually known, and that predated the first what is known as ASP event, amnesic shellfish poisoning event that happened on Prince Edward Island in Canada in uh, 1987, uh, where over 100 people got sick, three people actually uh, died, um, you know, and then it became a regulated toxin. People really didn't know about it about then uh, at that point in time, and Hitchcock certainly didn't know it was happening in the 1950s either. Um, and these can manifest as uh, initially gastrointestinal symptoms, but then later uh, neurological symptoms. And on the West Coast, where it's very, very common, um, the toxins can bioaccumulate. And so those same anchovies you see there, not only are they eaten by sea lions, and there's been incidents with sea lions, uh, birds love to feed on anchovies as well. And this is a particular harmful algal bloom that's been expanding in the U.S. So that y-axis is the fraction of the U.S. coastline that's experienced Sudonychia since 1990. So significantly increasing. Uh, and all those significant increases are on the East Coast and specifically there in the Northeast uh, because it was totally unknown to the East Coast up until, um, I think, within the last decade. Um, there was a... Sudonychia bloom that was well documented by the state of Connecticut in 2020. And you can see some of the cell densities here all across uh, the coastline of Connecticut, high cell densities, tested the shellfish, no toxins, and therefore no worries. Um, these are the densities that we saw last year in um, what we call the South Shore Estuary Reserve. These are locations in Great South Bay, Mauritius Bay, and Shinnecock Bay. Um, to understand what the implication of this blooms, these blooms were, we also put out something called solid phase toxin trackers. These are specifically resins that are meant to absorb toxins. Uh, and we did pull off of those uh, toxin trackers, we also call them SPAT, uh, demoic acid. And so we measured that with an ELISA kit. Uh, but there's still a lot to understand about all this. Um, and I can say that... Uh, Adrian looked back in prior years, and actually, we had been missing this. So he had found it in prior years as well. Um, so there are open questions we're still looking to address with regards to the toxin, uh, regard to the event, uh, regard to where else it might be happening, uh, and how it fits in in the scheme of things. Um, you know, we know that back in the 50s, 
in Mauritius Bay before the 1954 storm that made the inlet. Mauritius Bay was entirely closed, lined with duck farms that actually experienced harmful algal blooms, so specifically what were called green tides at the time. Uh, and we know that after that, we entered a period of record set setting uh, landings of hard clams uh, across you know, the, the biggest landings in the U.S. and also some of the largest Peconic Bay scallop landings as well. Uh, but since that time, we've had a, uh, show up on the scene a series of different harmful algal blooms in recent years, uh, both micro and macro algae, and both what we call the ecosystem disruptive type, but also the type that can make biotoxins. Beyond harmful algal blooms, I mentioned that map I showed also uh, low oxygen conditions, which can be brought on by algal blooms. When you have a lot of what we call carbon from these algal blooms and that carbon degrades, it can pull oxygen out of the water. Um, and it's actually dissolved oxygen is one of the only regulated water quality parameters through the Clean Water Act. Right? There's no rules on nitrogen levels in water. There's no rules on chlorophyll or phosphorus or water clarity, but there are federal laws, or there should say the Clean Water Act calls out dissolved oxygen and puts them in the responsibility in each state to have standards for dissolved oxygen. And so the New York standards are there. And so ideally your water is always above 4.8 milligrams per liter and you, uh, you know, allowable excursions, but not less than three milligrams per liter. So we go back to our monitoring network and see how 2023 matched up. Essentially, we find out that almost none of the sites met that standard, um, you know, suggesting actually, in some ways, the standard may need to be revisited. Um, you know, one big eye-opening event has been the advent and the now widespread use of devices that can measure oxygen all the time. So for almost all of these sites, these violations all occur at night. And so, you know, there had been the... Um, the tagline for a long time, but well, there's no oxygen problem here whatsoever. And that's totally true if you make measurements during the day in surface water when there's a lot of photosynthesis going on. Uh, but these water bodies, you know, at night when the water gets very, very warm, very, very stagnant, um, pre-dawn, you can see what things looked like last year. And I, and I can say some of the non-red sites were sites we didn't have oxygen loggers in. Um, so, you know, there's, there, there are issues with oxygen, no doubt. And the question is, does this actually matter? And uh, so uh, Jeff Kramer's here. He had a poster out there. There's Jeff. And I'm going to highlight some of his work where he's actually looking at, does this dissolve oxygen actually matter? And so he had a nifty experiment where he was bringing in water from Shinnecock Bay and just very, very vigorously bubbling that water, trying to get rid of that, what we call nocturnal hypoxia, low oxygen at night. And he did experiments with different types of bivalves, clams, scallops, oysters. Uh, and so he ran water either directly from the bay into his experimental vessels or having previously vigorously bubbled it uh, to try to remove that hypoxia. And so, you know, the, uh, the water coming in, uh, up, you can see on the top there, did fall below that three milligrams per liter. And now you can see those day-night cycles. So you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Everything looks great during the day, not great at night. Right? And, and again, the question is, well, should we care? You know, well, so it's, it's a little low at night, right? Because this is, this is not anywhere within the realm of a site that's bad. There's other sites that go to zero at night and stay that way uh, for a while. But this is just to show that Jeff could get rid of that uh, with his uh, bubbling maze. Um, and then he ran a bunch of experiments. I think he ran a total of nine. Is that right, Jim? He can't remember. He just presented it at a national meeting. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. And here's, a, here's an example of what he found. So firstly, he could significantly increase the growth rate of bivalves by bubbling that water at night. So that low oxygen does matter. And the, the regression there just shows it's directly related to how long the oxygen was low at night. And so the longer that hypoxia period went on, the greater the increase in growth, right? And so does low oxygen matter? Yes, it slows the growth of bivalves. And then a uh, second thing you can say, well, does that matter? Bivalves grow slow, what's the big deal? Okay, so just to say why that might matter, here are the survival rates for clams of different sizes, right? Percent survival. So adults, you put an adult out, no problem. If they're small, they're in trouble. 
Uh, and unfortunately, when we put out seed clams, a lot of times they're these very, very small ones. You know, sometimes we call these chicken McNuggets for crabs. They just go out there and they eat them all up. Uh, and so that's that. So the point being, if you're slowing their growth, they're spending more time at that lowest level. That's the most vulnerable to predation. So and I'll just say as a side note that Mike Dole and Tim Curtin are working very hard on methods to get these clams to grow faster and be protected against the predation before they go out. So you can see what the overall premise is here, that nitrogen is driving things. And so, you know, question, is this fact or fiction? Now, if you saw Jen Galeski's poster, you, you already have the punchline, but Jen was involved in some experiments she did actually last year of 2022. But I want to highlight them again because they were, um, I think, a little pretty innovative and pretty clear outcomes. So again, use those same sampling sites, north, south, east, and west across Long Island, collected the water, ran simple incubation experiments over 48 hours to see how that would affect algal growth rates, and then transferred that water to dark bottles to see how that would affect oxygen consumption. Unlike last year, I'm not going to go through all the results, but I'm just going to show you the highlights. We're writing a paper uh, about this that we publish hopefully soon. Um, and so we saw that 92% of the sites, when you added nitrogen, had a significant increase and the amount of algal biomass. So it's like one, maybe two stations that that didn't happen at. Um, in every site, adding more nitrogen led to an increase or significantly more oxygen pulled out of the water. Uh, and on average, the increase of algal biomass was 260%, so a very large increase. And the reduction in oxygen was about 110%. Um, so the nitrogen matters and it has important trickle down effects on the ecosystem. Beyond nitrogen, of course, we need to be cognizant of climate change. Um, we live in an era where, you know, frankly, climate is changing and the forces of, uh, if we use the term Anthropocene, that would be to define a time when humans are the dominant influence on climate and the environment. And even though these are often global processes, it's important to look through a local lens at all these things, uh, or use a local lens. Consider this uh, as we're considering managing uh, local ecosystems. So 2023 had lots of things that made everybody realize that the climate is changing. Uh, if you were around in early June, you might remember the days where we lived and it looked like we we're on Tatooine from Star Wars uh, <laughs> because the sun was obscured by forest fires. Um, but, you know, whatever, that was just a few days. But if you look at the data from 2023, it was the warmest record ever uh, by a lot. And, uh, you know, in prior years, you might have heard me say, well, it was pretty warm. But thank goodness we were in something called La Nina, which cools the planet a little bit. Well, La Nina ended last June and we moved into El Nino, which makes the planet even warmer. And you can see uh, not even close last year. And it wasn't just the planet. The oceans have been really warm as well. And you can see we're close to an epicenter of warming here. Uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit above average. So that's a lot. And, and actually, right now, the oceans are warmer than they have ever been. So the University of Maine has a website. You can look at what global ocean temperatures are. And so what you're looking at are all the years they've measured. So all those squiggle lines are all the different years. In the orange is what 2023 was, and now in 2024, we're even beyond that. Um, so things, and this, for whatever it's worth, you, there are ocean scientists who you know, I communicate with and who are communicating in the public. No one can really explain this, right? And this, that's like one of those old questions. Where is the tipping point? But there's not a, they, some of this can be explained by things like El Nino, by things like actually reducing the amount of, aerosols or particulates in the air, which is good for people's health, actually lets through a little bit more heat. But even if you calculate that in, you, the scientists can't add up to the math and get to the numbers that are here. Of course, this is all being driven by high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and we're at a level now, again, for the entire record, this is known as the Keeling curve when they started making these measurements that we've never had before. And of course, this is the CO2 in the atmosphere, what changes temperatures. And the temperatures in our coastal waters are actually warming faster than the global average. So this is using satellite-based temperatures for Long Island coastal waters uh, just in summer. 
And so, you know, our waters, everything is warming a little bit, but the rate of warming in summer is significantly higher than during other seasons. And if we look at 2023, um, on the top is the temperature trend in sort of a qualitative sense, and the bottom is the actual rainfall data. Um, for those of you who don't know, we should get about four inches of rain per month. So just looking at last May through October, we had some drought months, uh, and we had a few months were above average. But what you can see also is there were some extreme events. So single day events where we might be getting four inches of rain, so a month worth of rain all at once. And that is a new trend that we're seeing um, across the Northeast. And so from the middle of the 20th century through 2012, the Northeast in particular saw the greatest increase in what is Noah calls very heavy precipitation. Um, and in addition, Noah just came out with this study here showing that the what they would call 100 year storm now happens every 10 years. Um, and you know, if you remember last summer or even this past winter, this is what's happening. Our total amount of rainfall isn't changing, but it's coming more all at once. So more rainfall, more warming. This is uh, last July, which I think was deemed the warmest day uh, of, well, that the planet's seen. And so one consequence of climate change is that as the oceans warm, organisms move towards the poles to stay in their thermal optimum. And that's something that's been seen with some bacteria in the ocean. So specifically, Vibrio vulnificus. This is a bacteria that in the 20th century was only in the Gulf. It had never been seen outside of the Gulf of Mexico. But what you can see, and this paper just came out last April, is that during the 20th century, it slowly moved up the East Coast uh, and coming closer and closer with the, the closest location being sort of central New Jersey. This same paper put projections out and had models, biological models, trying to understand when well, Vibrio vulnificus might move further up. And so they considered two time frames on the left and the top two different emission um, scenarios and determined that if we hit, if we continued at high to medium CO2 emissions, uh, by the end of the century, we'll see Vibrio vulnificus come to Long Island. Well, that held true that paper held true for about five months. Yeah. Uh, and then, so you can see what the headline is here now. And you, what you can also see is that shortly thereafter, the CDC issued a health advisory uh, for the East Coast, specifically uh, talking about that the increased occurrence of vibrial vulnificus infections. And just to correct this paper here, the newspaper, the title of that New York Times article is technically correct, but it reads wrong. Uh, because you'd read it and you'd think that people died from in the water and eating shellfish. That's not the case. And so I actually made sure of that in speaking to people uh, in the health departments at the state and local level. It was through exposure to sea seawater. So people uh, exposed to water with this bacteria. And so just some important fast facts about this organism. It's found in warm brackish water, so it requires salt but brackish, so it actually you know, historically likes a little bit lower salinity. It can affect open wounds. Uh, people who are immunocompromised are the most likely to be vulnerable to this. Um, and it can lead to death of flesh in a very fast period of time. It can be, it, it can be a scary medical condition. Um, now, I'll emphasize that in New York, there are very stringent rules on shellfish, so that any time there are shellfish harvested in warm months, they immediately go on ice. This was actually done for a different Vibrio species, Vibrio parahemolyticus. But in both cases, this icing of the shellfish ceases the growth of the shellfish, uh, of, of the Vibrio in the shellfish. Uh, and so that, and that has been totally effective. No one has died from Vibrio from shellfish in New York. But in our lab, we specifically looked for Vibrio last year in the water. Uh, we used a quantitative PCR method used our same sampling sites that we're sampling every week anyway. Um, and we found plenty of Vibrio in the water. This was in late August and early September. Um, and about half, one third of the samples we analyzed, so we had a few samples analyzed for different locations and about half of the sites. And I'll just emphasize there were two clusters. One was in the North Shore towards the West and a second cluster uh, in East Hampton. 
And we did a little bit of statistics. It was an inverse correlation with salinity. So meaning that the areas that got a lot of runoff from fresh water had the highest levels of this Vibrio vulnificus. Um, and some of these levels are really high. So that paper, we the method we used to do this was a paper from the Chesapeake. None of them measured 10,000 uh, of these uh, Vibrio uh, gene copies per 100 milliliters. But if we look to what happens in the Gulf, this is sort of a review paper, and if anybody's interested, I could share this with them. Um, the incidences in the Gulf in Texas and the Florida totally follow temperatures. This is a high temperature event. Um, but the temperatures, as you can see, aren't that high. So 80, I mean, they're high, but in our enclosed water bodies, we can see levels this high. So the C CDC has advice on, on, on uh, about Vibrio vulnificus. And so, you know, a big one is in summer, if it's warm and you have an open cut, we shouldn't go in the water. We're certainly protected. Uh, they recommend people who are immunocompromised should have foot protection so they're not having fresh open wounds. Um, and then there's just common sense things. If you get a cut in the seawater, you can clean it out. And if you see an infection developing, probably good to see a doctor. Um, and if people, you know, I know, I know there are, Commercial fishermen who know exactly what they're doing, but in summer, those people like to recreational these shellfish, and hopefully with a license. Um, but it's very important that people, if they're doing that, know what they're doing, know where they're doing it, and are paying attention to the DEC rules and closures. Um, so, and again, this is an event. These, this event, this occurrence, is directly a function of there being more rainfall, salinity dropping, and warmer temperatures. And of course, beyond that with climate change, we also think about things like ocean acidification, low oxygen conditions. I've sometimes used the term, the four horsemen of the ocean climate change apocalypse for all these things happening at once. Um, and they can all act and interact together. And I'll just emphasize that, you know, beyond bacteria, there's also of course effects on major important shell fisheries. So we know, for example, the Long Island Sound lobster is no longer a fishery. And that's because the Long Island Sound are warm too much. Uh, we also know warm temperatures are not good for cold adapted species like blue mussels and scallops that are now a lot more scarce, and probably linked to higher temperatures. And the thing is about temperatures, maybe you've seen these sorts of graphs before, you know, where we go depends on emissions. That's a global issue that, you know, we hopefully can play some role in, but, you know, there's a billion people or 1.3 billion people in India and 1.3 billion people in China and a billion people in Africa. And hopefully they're going to be cutting carbon too, but you know, we don't know where we're going to go here, but you can see what the potential outcomes are. Um, but on getting back to the nitrogen front, you know, we know how altering nitrogen levels can affect the outcomes for groundwater. Uh, and that's just shown here. This is from Suffolk County sub watershed plan. And we know that, Plans in the past to mitigate nitrogen have been successful. So, for example, uh, this is from the Long Island Sound study that and decided in the year 2000 we we're going to cut nitrogen loading to Long Island Sound by 60 percent. And it wasn't a, it was a huge lift financially, but less complicated because it was really just addressing major sewage treatment plants and upgrading those. And so what you can see, if you compare the left before the implementation and the right afterwards, I mean, there are large regions of the sound that had always experienced low oxygen hypoxia that now do not. Uh, and if you look here, this is the change in the size of the hypoxia zone of Long Island Sound with the, si the amount of nitrogen loading in Long Island Sound. And you can see, particularly since it was implemented in 2003, these things track very, very well. Okay, and so what about out here in Suffolk County? You know, and on Long Island in particular, there's over 400,000 on-site septic tanks discharging into the aquifer. Um, you know, these uh, Suffolk County sub-watersheds plan has a plan for upgrading these systems. And if you look at this map and specifically focus on that hot pink area, essentially what that's showing is what are the priorities that are for upgrading these systems. And what I really want to emphasize, if you look at that map, that does not look like someone said, you know, okay, we'll just do the within five miles of the coastline. This is very carefully thought out and specifically thinking about what water bodies are most vulnerable. 
Well, the South Shore is really vulnerable. Those water bodies are super, super shallow. Uh, and their tidal flushing is the lowest you can see anywhere. Uh, and so as a consequence, there's a big emphasis on the South Shore. And you can see conversely on the North Shore, where the water quality is pretty good, not a priority. Uh, and the other thing that really was highlighted is a lot of the areas that are important for drinking water, uh, so public supplies. And again, that plan lays out how the groundwater nitrogen levels could change with the implementation of this plan. And you know, if you look at these two maps, the one in the lower right with the implementation of the plan, you'll see largely absent of those red areas that have the high nitrate, which is again, not just a ecological potential uh, impact, but also could be a public health risk. So there are many types of onsite septic systems that can now be installed to replace existing systems. Uh, at Stony Brook, I direct the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. We have some fine people from the center who came here to present one of their posters, working very hard to advance uh, what the center does, harnessing science to engineer clean water for the protection of public health and the environment in New York and beyond. And uh, one of the ways we've been doing that is something we call our nitrogen removing biofilters. These are septic systems that um, are built on very simple technology, so a drain field that's underlined by sand, that's underlined by that, by sand mixed with wood chips. Um, and these systems have been performing very, very well. Uh, what this plot here shows you the uh, effluent from different NRB systems uh, that have been tested and are available in Suffolk County in some cases. The green ones are ones that have been approved at two different levels of approval. Uh, the Blue ones have not yet been approved, and the red ones are two of the NRBs that we've constructed. There's two different types, uh, and they've had the best discharge, uh, the lowest nitrogen output, and you can see how different that is from the existing systems at 100 milligrams per liter. Um, so we're very, very proud of this, and we took a lot of time to uh, design these and, uh, you know, and uh, kind of settled on these two. At Originally, we had three different designs. And beyond nitrogen, of course, there's more in wastewater that we don't want getting into our public supply of drinking water, uh, things like emerging contaminants. And we've tested the functionality of the NRBs for these emerging contaminants. And this is more than two dozen pharmaceuticals, drugs, personal care products, solvents, all things we don't want in our drinking water. They're all a move that very high percentages. These percent removal rates are higher than what you'd see for a sewage treatment plant. Um, and these systems have been provisionally approved for installation in both Nassau and Suffolk County. Um, you know, there are up to $40,000 people can get for grants to install these things in East Hampton and South Hampton town. Um, and we, there's an installation company, XCAB, we've been working with from the very beginning. Uh, and they're working with Suffolk County to get a, approval for installing these. Uh, and are saying that they can install these for about the same price as a Fuji clean system or a hydro action system, which are the two most commonly used systems. So, you know, they won't work in all locations. They need a little bit more space, but they, as I showed, they're very effective in removing contaminants. And then the last thing I'll just mention is, you know, it, even with upgrading these systems, it's going to take a while for that groundwater to work out of the aquifer. Uh, and so in the meanwhile, we're working on what we call in the water solutions uh, to see what we can do to address water quality now. Um, and so one of those I'm gonna talk about is with regards to filter feeding bivalves. And I've showed you that we lost a lot of those filter feeding bivalves, but if we can bring those back, we are hopeful we can change ecosystems to make them, have them filter the water and expand seagrasses and improve water clarity and quality. And uh, you know, one of the places where we've done this and had success has been in Shinnecock Bay and something known as the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. Uh, Tim and Mike had presented a poster on this. Um, so through this program, we've planted over 5 million adult hard clams. Remember that I showed you that graph before, the ones that survive. Uh, and not only survive, but two adult clams can have a billion offspring. Uh, and so that's the awesome reproductive power of bivalves. So we created these hard clam spawner sanctuaries, so areas where the, we have 50,000 clams planted in a half an acre. This was done with the um, collaboration with the Southampton Town Trustees uh, and the Southampton Town Baymans Association for that matter. And um, what we've seen, and the whole idea is not that they were filled to the water, but that they will reproduce. And those 5 million will produce tens of million more clams 
and their offspring will help filter the water. It takes time to do that. Uh, and But with patients, we've seen success. So this is data that Mike Dole had put together uh, showing the increase in the abundance of hard clams in eastern Shinnecock Bay. Uh, and this is size specific. And so what you see in the pink, the red, the orange, those are small clams. Those are ones that had been spawned in just the past few years. So we know they're being produced in C2. Uh, and we know that there's been an increase of, uh, we think, 50 million additional clams in the system. And a happy outcome that we didn't anticipate from the beginning is that this is also translated into more harvests in the town of Southampton. So what you're looking at here are the different South Shore estuaries and the landings of hard clams according to the DEC. So this is DEC data. And what you see is that we, our program began in 2012. Um, we actually wouldn't take credit for the first few years because the clams had to grow, spawn, and um, but you can see since 2015, the very strong trajectory of landings in Shinnecock Bay. And if you live locally, you see something recently in summer that you didn't see a decade ago. And that is there are clamors making a living on the bay harvesting clams in summer in Shinnecock Bay. Uh, with the landings exceeding Great South Bay, which is uh, about 10 times larger by area. So these clams, the adults and the, the even the juveniles do filter the water. And this is the increased or decrease the amount of time it takes them to filter the water. It should take weeks. They can now do it in days. Uh, and we've seen an end of brown tides in this bay and an increase in water clarity and also a decrease in other algae. Uh, and this paper I can send to anyone. It's freely available. I wanted to read it. Uh, and Brad Peterson's group has shown that there's been an increase in over 400,000 square meters of seagrass in the system since the implementation of the program, particularly in the western part of the bay. Um, so showing that with more bivalves, they are positively impacting water quality. Uh, and then the last thing I'll just mention is some work we're doing with seaweeds and specifically here kelp, which are photosynthetic organisms that are taking up CO2, taking up nitrogen, producing oxygen, and maybe even impacting harmful algal blooms. So Mike Dole, where is Mike? I keep saying his name. Go ahead, Mike. There he is. He's been the champion of this. If Mike was not in the lab, I would not have nothing to say about seaweeds and kelp. Uh, Mike, uh, as a former oyster farmer, collaborated with uh, more than 10 different oyster farms across Long Island that has really done a great job of leading this effort, bringing in really national experts to collaborate with us to get going and then paying it forward and training other people in New York on how to grow kelp. Um, so you can see the locations we've done this work. Um, we've got good data showing that a single acre of kelp farm can remove between 100 and 200 pounds of nitrogen per year. And that's on the order of eight to 10 homes in septic systems. And uh, Sue Wicks, who I saw earlier today, I don't think she's here, but uh, her Violet Cove uh, farm is uh, growing. Is it an acre of kelp, you think, Mike? It looks like it to me. It's got to be, It's on that order, I would say, yeah. Um, and so that's the first commercial kelp farm on Long Island in Merch's Bay. Um, so we've done experimental work with kelp uh, on the neighboring farm, Great Gun Oyster Farm, um, and specifically growing kelp and oysters together and trying to understand how that might affect uh, the oysters. And in this case, we're specifically thinking about something known as ocean acidification, right? Low pH, which can be inhibitory to shellfish. And so uh, this here's where we put the kelp out with and with, with the oysters and we had our control site. Uh, we have an autonomous vehicle that we use to make this plot. This is pH through the oyster farm. And so what this shows is the very high pH right around where the kelp is. So that kelp is raising the pH, the opposite of ocean acidification. And so we also put probes out at the control location of the oyster farm and also in the kelp. And that's what's shown here. And what this shows, again, the other one was showing it in space, this is showing it in time, that within the kelp, you're getting higher pH. And those lower pHs can be detrimental to shellfish. Uh, and that's why when we grew oysters here, the ones that grew either right in the kelp or right next to the kelp grew significantly faster, be it by shell or by weight, compared to those further away. And then the last thing to mention is, you know, with regards to harmful algal blooms, uh, Lane Silvers is not here. She's on her way actually interviewing for a job. I don't know if she want me to tell anybody that, but uh, good luck, Lane. Um, 
She's finishing her PhD this semester, and um, she's done some work with kelp and Alexandria. And if you look here, this is the idea of a picture being worth a thousand words. On the left is an Alexandrian cell. On the right is one that's been exposed to the kelp. And so, you know, we we have lots of people in the room here who do lots of work with kelp. And um, the kelp is making and releasing bioactive compounds. So if you have kelp on a line where the kelp is, the line's nice and clean. And where the kelp's been pulled off, there's all sorts of fouling going on. So they've got chemicals to ward off other algae. Uh, and micro and macro. Lane also did experiments where she collected water that had Alexandria in it, drew it out here at the marine lab, uh, either did a control where she added nothing to it, she added nutrients, or she added nutrients and just a modest amount of kelp at a gram per liter and could decrease the amount of Alexandria in the water there um, by threefold in just 48 hours. And, and I won't show it, but she can also, she also in the same experiment, decrease the amount of the toxin that gets into bivalves uh, by doing that. And I'll just finally just mention that kelp only grows in the winter. And so we're doing a lot of work thinking about what can we do in the summer to complement what the kelp does. And so here, and we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years uh, with different types of red branching macroalgae, red seaweeds. And one of them is shown here. Um, we've been working with agardiella, with gracilaria, they grow robustly in warm months and have many of the same positive effects. And so we're looking to understand what can complement kelp, uh, kelp in the in the summer months, and we think some of these seaweeds might do the job. So, you know, we are not going to solve global climate change with kelp. We are not going to fix our estuaries with kelp. But I do want to emphasize this thing I call the halo effect, and that is that the kelp when co-grown with shellfish on a shellfish farm can have positive effects on those shellfish, uh, suppressing harmful algal blooms, um, uh, increasing the pH of seawater, rescuing bivalves from ocean acidification. Uh, and we've shown this actually again and again, you co-grow the shellfish with the seaweeds and they grow faster. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm done. I'm just highlighting that excessive nitrogen from wastewater is a threat to coastal ecosystems and human health. Um, climate change is accelerating and has a compounding effect on coastal ecosystems along with nitrogen. Um, upgrading septic systems is our primary means for addressing this issue, particularly in the long term in a sustainable way. Um, and then in the meanwhile, seaweeds and shellfish hold the promise to regionally mitigate water quality impairment with things with regards to like harmful algal blooms and acidification. Um, so with that, I will thank you for your attention.